Hey, shalom, shalom. Shalom, shalom. Shalom, shalom. shalom, shalom. shalom, shalom. shalom, shalom. shalom. It's a pleasure seeing everybody here again tonight. And um, the Father's will. We know it's going to be the Father's will. We're going to have a nice, nice dynamic lesson tonight. And we're going to continue on from where we left off last week. We're going to be taking another look at the book of Barashit, which is in Hebrew, Genesis. And we're going to be looking at chapters 1 and 2. And this is going to be part 2 of the series. And pray for we may be able to get through it tonight and we can move on. All right? So uh, without further ado, what we're going to do is first read... Uh, the Ten Commandments. No, first of all, let me do a little bonus so far seven times, and then we're going to read the Ten Commandments, and then after that, we'll flip over and read the Renewed Covenant, and we're, from there, we're going to get the class started. Renewed Covenant first. The, uh, the Renewed Covenant first. First. And then the Ten Commandments. All right. But deliver us from all that is evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and all the stain belongs to the Father. Hallelujah. 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 Father, we thank you for those who were able to make it here tonight, that you provoke them, give them full wisdom, knowledge, and understanding of your Torah. We pray for those who were not able to make it here tonight, that you also provoke them, Father. Show them your praises, your love, your kindness, and your mercy that you have bestowed upon our forefathers, Abraham, and Isaac, and Jacob. Father, we pray that you continue to walk with us through these troublous times that we're facing, that you be that bridge for us, Father, over the troubled waters and all of the trials and tribulations that we're facing in our everyday lives. Father, all the same belongs to you, and we give all the honor to you through your son, Yahusha HaMashiach. Hallelujah. 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 All right. So, we're going to get it started. Renew covenant, right? Oh, yes. All right, Yeremiah, the 31st chapter, verses 31 33. Behold, Behold the, the days day come, saith your Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Yashrael and the house of Yehuda, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break. Although I was a husband unto them, saith Yahuwah. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Yashorah after those days, saith Yahuwah. I will put my law into their inward parts, and write it in their hearts, and will be their Elohim, and they shall be my people. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So next we're going to read the Ten Commandments. And this could, be, this could be found in the book of Exodus or the book of Shemot, the 20th chapter, verses 1 through 17. And Yahuwah spake all these words, saying, I am Yahuwah the Elohim, which have brought thee out of the land of Mizraim, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other Elohim before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Or, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, thy sovereign, thy Elohim, am a jealous Elohim, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me 
and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of Yahuwah Elohim in vain, for Yahuwah would not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember the Shabbat day to keep it set apart. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Shabbat of Yahuwah thy Elohim. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days Yahuwah made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in the midst, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore Yahuwah blessed the Shabbat day, and made it set apart. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land, which Yahuwah thy Elohim giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, thou shalt not live that in thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not come thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Hallelujah. Over the Ten Commandments. It is found in the book of Exodus, the 20th chapter, verses 1 through 17. Okay, Bishop Ricard, um, it's a pleasure again to see everybody here tonight. And we have two young ladies here. It's a pleasure to see you here tonight with the congregation of Yashra Um uh, We pray that you can get some understanding. Um, if you have any questions regarding anything that's going to be said here tonight, uh, please feel free to, um, to ask the questions after the class. We appreciate you coming in tonight. It's always good to see new faces. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah. So, um, Mr. Bakai, again, we're going to be taking another look at the book of Bereshit, which is the word Genesis in Hebrew. Okay, um, this will be part two. But like all of the classes that I do, we want to make sure that we give all the stage to the Father, the creator of heaven and earth, the mighty one of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It is very important that we acknowledge these men here because the Father made the covenants with our ancient forefathers. And if it wasn't for Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, none of us would be here today. So again, we want to make sure that we give all the stage to the Father and for the Redeemer. It's very important that we understand um, who the Redeemer is, and the Redeemer is Yahusha, a Mashiach, and the Mashiach came to actually redeem the nation of Yashraol. And the nation of Yashraol is the nation of Israel, is who we are today, which are scattered amongst the four corners of the earth. We are the people of the book, according to scripture. Now, before we get started um, with the actual lesson, all right, we want to talk about um, how important it is for us to give all esteem to the Father. And when you say the Father, you're going to write it down here for the Lord. Okay? Um, when you say the Father, we're talking about in the ancient Hebrew, we're talking about the Yo, the He, The name. We have the tetragrammaton. The word tetra means four. Grammaton means grammar. So we have the yo, the he, the who, the he. So you would have the yo, he, who, he. And what we're just basically doing is just adding vowels in between the letters here. And we have Yahuwah. So this would be the name of the Father. In the ancient Hebrew, this is the pronunciation actually. And the way that it would be written in Hebrew would be, the ancient Hebrew would be the Yod, the He, the Hu, the He. And in the Aramaic, we would have it this way. The Yod, the He, the Hu, 
right? So these are the four characters here, two, three, four. And again, this is where we get uh, the word Yahuwah. All right, so we want to make sure that we give all the steam to the Father of uh, Yahuwah. And the first scripture that we want to go to to make sure that we always acknowledge the Father. We must always acknowledge the Father. And we want to go to the book of Matthew. The book of Matthew, Yahu. And we want to start with the sixth chapter, and I'm going to read the first verse. This is the Mashiach, all right? He's speaking with his Talmudim. The word Talmudim, which is Hebrew, but it's, it means disciple. So we have the word disciple, and in Hebrew, the word disciple will be his Talmudim, his students. But when you, prayers, enter into your closet, okay, your safe place, your dedicated place, your place of seclusion, and close the door and pray to the Father. All right, that's going to be very important. Pray to the Father who is in secret, and thy Father who seeth in secret will reward thee openly. What All right, in the book of Matthew, the sixth chapter, verse six, excuse me. Six and six. So we have here in the book of Matthew, the sixth chapter, where the Mashiach has given us instructions on how to reconnect back to the Father. And the reason why I'm using the word reconnect because it's been a disconnect. And the reason why we know that there's a disconnect is because our people are scattered again against or amongst the four corners of the earth because of disobedience. And the disobedience comes about with the prayer that we just for well, the commandments that we just read in the book of Exodus, the 20th chapter, we were told that we needed to follow those instructions that was outlined to us in the book of Exodus, and being that we broke those laws, again, what we need to do is to reconnect, and the way that we reconnect is by <coughs> praying, and we're going to go with some more scriptures to prove that. So we went to the book of Matthew, the 6th chapter, verse 6, and the next you want to read is the book of 2 Kings. Second Kings. We're going to go with the fourth chapter. Second Kings, the fourth chapter. We're going to do verse 33. Verse 33. Actually, let's move to 32. We have Elisha, okay? And when Elisha was come into the house, behold, the child was dead and laid upon his bed. He went in, therefore, and shut the door upon them twain, and he prayed unto the father. And so what I wanted to bring in, everybody's familiar with this story here? Mm -hmm. Okay, how are you? Yeah. Yeah. Right. And so what I just wanted to share with everybody is that that intimate time that we all need, that intimate time where we need to really just shut things down from, just shut everything down. Sometimes you might have to do that from um, your wives, your children, uh, turn off the television, anything that's going to be a disturbance, and use that personal time now to get into your, pray, um, your proper prayer mode or your most set apart place and actually begin to pray and ask the Father for um, forgiveness, um, make sure that you acknowledge the Father for all the great things that he has done for you, waking you up in the morning, giving you um, full capability of all your, um, your, your faculties, you're able to see, you're able to walk, all these things here, a lot of times we take for granted. And what we want to do is make sure that we give the Father thanks for every single thing. Take absolutely nothing for granted. Because there's a lot of things that we're able to do here in this room tonight. That a lot of other people are not able to do. And a lot of times we just take those things for granted. So let's always make sure for every single thing we find time to give thanks and praises to the Father for all the great things that he has done for us. So now we're going to go back to the book of Matthew, the sixth chapter, and the Mashiach now is going to actually share with us uh, 
how to pray. All right? This is very important on how to pray. Because a lot of times, when we pray, we pray as if the Father is a genie. All right? So we're always asking, give me, give me, give me, give me. Father, I want a car. Father, I like a big house. I want a big bank account. All these things that we want. But we never take time to reconsider or to consider now whether or not we have that connection to the Father. So, and again, we're going to see how the Mashiach is actually sharing with us on how to pray. So, listen at these instructions very, very um, carefully. But thou, Quaker English, but when you prayest, enter into thy closet and close the door and pray to the Father who is in secret and thy Father who seeth the secret will reward thee openly. And when you pray, be not uh, repetitious like the heathen, for they expect to be heard for the abundance of words. Therefore, be not like them. For your father knoweth what is needful for you before you even ask him. Verse 9. This is, this is where we want to get to. In this matter, therefore pray you, our father. All right? And I have brought out so many times before that we do have, again, the yo hey ku hey. All right? We brought out the four letters of the Tetragrammaton, giving us the father's name. But what I like was going on in the book of Matthew, the sixth chapter, is that the Mashiach is not calling the Father by name. He's respecting the Father by calling him Father. So there's a difference between calling a person by the name versus now noticing or respecting the person by the, the title. It's just a, a, a form of respect. And I just like the way that the Mashiach has it. Because when we begin to get into what we call the New Testament, you don't see um, written in English, that is, anyone calling the Father by, quote unquote, his personal name. Mm -hmm. You know, so the way that I like to do it, I'm not telling nobody not to pronounce the name. But in order to pronounce the name, you should have a personal relationship with the Father. So there are credentials that the Father is looking for in order for you to have a relationship with him. So all of this is about a relationship. So watch. We have, in this manner, pray you, O Father, which art in heaven, set apart is your name. We pray that the Father kingdoms, that his kingdom come, that his will be done as it is in heaven, so on earth. Give us our needful bread this day, and forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors. And that's something that a lot of us have problems doing, forgiving one another. If we can't forgive one another, there's absolutely no way in the world that the Father can forgive you for your trespasses. So this whole thing now is about forgiveness, it's about love, and it's about reconnecting back to the Father. And we're asking now for the right order that is in heaven to actually be able to manifest itself here on the earth. So thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And as we see now, everything on earth is in corruption. And so we pray now for that peace and that shalom and harmony that's in heaven to also at some point manifest itself here on earth, and the only way that that can be done is with the return, excuse me, of Yahusha HaMashiach. So if you give us our debts, that we forgive our debtors, and bring us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power, and it has glory here, but all the stain belongs to the Father forever and ever. Hallelujah or amen. So, what I found interesting with that whole prayer there, all right, because the Hebrew language is going to be very, very important. And the reason why the Hebrew language is going to be very important, because our forefathers spoke in Hebrew. What we have here now is a translation um, in English, and it's going to be hard to look at the scriptures 
from a Hebraic perspective, looking at the English. These are Hebrews. You have to look at from a Hebrew's perspective, a Hebrew's eyes. Now, the word for uh, prayer or to pray in Hebrew is the word te I think it's two L's, tefila. Now, what's interesting about this word is that it's a verb. See, all these things matter in Hebrew, where we have present tense, we have past tense, we have to be able to identify verbs. All these things are very important. So when we begin to look at the word tefillah, and we look at it, and it, is, and it is a verb, we have now that this word tefillah now is also, um, we have in the definition, the word judge. So, when we make our prayers to the Father, what we're supposed to be doing now is judging ourselves. Meaning now that when we're praying, we're supposed to be confessing our sins to the Father. But we have it backwards because we're living in this society where when we pray, we're always asking for something. Because you might see it a lot of times with the Catholic Church where they go into like a little box or a little closet and they go and pray to the Father and they confess their sins. The concept is right. The concept is right. So what we just want people to understand though, the importance of prayer is that you're now acknowledging okay, you're acknowledging your sins. It's a confession, is what you're doing. So when you make a confession secretly to the Father, the Father now will openly bless you because you're now acknowledging your sins, all right? We're all about now forgiving our debts. When we talk about forgiving our debts, we're not necessarily talking about your student loans, your car payments. That's not what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Because we have to now look at, I'm going to erase this here now, the Father sent his son, Yahusha HaMashiach, and his name is Yahusha, which means Yah saves, um, saves, or savior. And then we have to look at now, who did Yahusha, who is commonly known as um, Jesus, and everybody knows that his last name is not Christ. So we don't have to write that. All right. So again, the father sent his son, okay, Yahusha, which is commonly known as Jesus. And Yahusha means that Yah, which is the father, saves. And he's using his son to actually perform this redemption. So the Mashiach now is the Redeemer, or he's granted redemption for the nation of Yashra'al, commonly known as the nation of Israel. And this is the reason why we brought out now the importance of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Because the Father actually made, he made this covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And we are the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We broke the laws, statutes, and commandments. And so the only way that we can reconnect back to the Father is going back to Exodus, the 20th chapter, and understanding um, the Ten Commandments that the Father have outlined for us. All right? So um, I pray that that was um, easy to be uh, understood. But here we go. We're going to roll up our sleeves, all right? We're going to go ahead and get into tonight's lesson. Oh, we have our good brother here, um, Jabu. He's been doing his homework. He's been doing some reading. So I'm sure that he's going to have um, some questions for us so we can go ahead and make sure that everything is crystal clear with tonight's lesson as we do part two of another look at Bereshit or the book of Genesis, chapters one and two. Now, um, when we look at Genesis, Okay, when you go to Genesis, the first chapter. Let's take a quick. 
close look at this. And what we're going to be doing now is looking at this now from a Hebraic perspective. All right, that's going to be very, very key. A Hebraic perspective. at starting with verse 1. We're just going to do a quick recap. It says, in the beginning created the heaven, Elohim, excuse me, Elohim, it has God and maybe in a lot of your books here. It says, but in the beginning Elohim, but we know to be Yahuwah Elohim. That is very important. In the beginning, Yahuwah Elohim, and the word Elohim is plural. It says that he created the heavens and the earth and it said that the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the spirit of Elohim moved upon the face of the waters. Elohim said, let there be light, and there was light, and Elohim saw the light that it was good, and Elohim divided the light from the darkness. Now, just looking at verses 1 through 4. 1 through 4. When we look at that again from um, a Hebraic perspective, there's some things that I found very, very interesting. So we can go back to the board again and show you some of the things that I found interesting. We can look at it from a Hebraic perspective. It says that the Father creates. Okay, created. The Hebrew word for create or created is bara. The Father created the heavens and the earth, but be between created and heavens, we have uh, a, in Hebrew, you will see this only in the Hebrew, not in the English. You will see um, this letter here. We had talked about it last week. The Aleph and the top. Okay, this is just is pronounced et or et. <coughs> okay, and we talked about the Hebrew um, symbols where the Aleph represents the strong leader and we have the Tau or the last letter in the Hebrew alphabet. This, may, this is uh, the sign, the mark, or the symbol. This, this is the symbol. So the strong leader, which we know to be the Mashiach now, is to lead us now to the sign, to the mark, to the symbol. What we should also notice too now is that when we read the book of uh, Genesis, it says in the beginning, when you can only find this in the Hebrew now, is that the first letter that we see is a bet. Okay, it has a ba. And this means in. And this is how the bets look in Hebrew. This is a, that's the bets. Now, you're going to notice that in every Hebrew Bible, this letter here is enlarged. But the thing now is that there are no capital letters. There's no um, question marks, there's no parentheses, there's no chapters or verses in Hebrew. Mm -hmm. Now, so the question is now is that why is this letter in large or in a capital form when there's no capital letters in Hebrew? This vet here, it looks like this, okay, that's the vet in the Aramaic Hebrew, and then you have the bet that looks like this in the ancient Hebrew. But only thing that we need to know with this particular letter here, that this bet in Hebrew means house. So from the very beginning, the father is trying to build 
a house. And the reason why the vex is so big or is, is so large is that the father is not trying to build just a regular house. He's trying to build a large, extensive house because the house has to be filled with people. And so when we go to the book of Genesis, it keeps using the word um, to be fruitful and to multiply. So whenever you're multiplying something now, you will need a big enough place now to keep the thing that you're actually multiplying. Now, another thing, this is the first letter when you be begin to read the Hebrew, um, uh, the book of Genesis, the first chapter in Hebrew, that vex is enlarged. But the vex is not the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Anybody know what the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet is? The Aleph, right. So we have a house, but it's very important for us to understand who runs or who is the head of the house. When you join the Aleph and the Bet together, you get the word Ab, which means father. So the one now who's actually in control or building the house is the Aleph, the one that has the strength, and when you put the two Hebrew characters together, you get the word Father, and the name of the Father, as we have the scripture, is Yehor, and then we have Elohim. All right? Yehor Elohim. Okay. Back off this here a little bit. Okay, so we have the word um, the father from the beginning. He's creating. The father is what we call a master geneticist. This is what we're going to be able to see in the um, in the book of Genesis, chapter one, verses one through four. Another word that I found very um, interesting. It talks about in the beginning uh, there was darkness upon the face of the earth, and the father said, "Let there be light." That word be. B E is the Hebrew word Haya. So we have the He, the Yo, and the He. He said, Let there be light. But the word Haya means, I'll write it right here, Ha, Haya means to be or to exist. It said, let there be light, and there was light, and the word was is also haya, which means, obviously, again, to be and to exist. Now watch how we read this now in Scripture. It's going to all make sense here. Pray for me. So we won't go too far. Too far. I mean, do I need a backup or any? Is there any questions so far? Everybody's cool. Good. Okay. I'll go. Yeah. No, no, even good. if you back up, it's going to take us a while to catch it. <laughs> <laughs> Everything is good. Everything is good. Okay. Um, so watch this now. In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form, and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the spirit or the ruach of Elohim moved upon the face of the water. So we had talked about last week that there was a flood on the earth at this time. And Elohim said, let there be, we talked about the word be, which is haya, let there be light, and there was light. Now, let there be, keeping everything in its proper context, contextual reading is going to be very important. Elohim said, let there be light which is in the future, future tense, let there be light, and there was light. So we have future and present. Future and present. Elohim said, let there be light, and there was light. And Elohim saw the light, and the Hebrew word for saw is ra'ah. Elohim, or Yahuwah Elohim, saw the light, that it was good, and Elohim divided the light from the darkness. Now, what we have...
have here so far is that we don't see the creation of water. The water was already there. We don't even see, and we're going to show this later on down the line, we don't see the creation of light, and we don't see the creation of darkness. Okay? And we, we need to explain what is actually going on in verse 1 through, excuse me, in verse 4. So my question is, I'm mean, 3 and 4, just to make sure that everybody's on the same page here, when verse 3, and it says that Elohim said, let there be light, and there was light, what is your understanding of what this light is or was? It's referring to what? Illumination. Illumination. Okay, um, when we say illumination, we're talking about, because I don't want to put any words in anybody's mouth, so when we say illumination, meaning now that um, it was dark as it is dark outside, and then all of a sudden now there's light, and now there's light outside. Is that everybody's understanding? Okay, great. Now, this all happened on day one. Okay, day one. We know day one in modern day um, speaking, because day one just means day one. But we have day one in Hebrew, we have um, what we call Yom, which is day, and we have Rishon, okay, in Hebrew. So this would be your day one. All right, day one. Now, go to verse third. I'm gonna read verse thirteen and fourteen. It says, "Now in the evening and the morning was the third day, and Elohim said, Let there be lights in the firmament of heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years." Now, just looking at verse 14, where it says now, and Elohim said, let there be lights in the firmament of heaven to divide the day from the night. What do you believe that is? It's the sun. So what is going on in verses 1 and 3 in day 1? To become light. Absolutely. So this is what I'm just trying to show you here, is making sure that everybody is reading everything in its proper context. Because remember now, in day one, it talked about void and darkness was on the face of the earth. When we look at void and darkness, we're talking about a point of chaos. Everything was in a chaotic state. So here, we're not talking about the sun, the moon, and the stars. We're not talking about this. That word, um, Light there in Hebrew is the Hebrew word um, or, or, or. What we have here now at this point, again, looking at everything from a Hebraic perspective, because there's a literal way of reading the scripture, and then there's um, like a more defined way of looking at it. And what we're going to be trying to do here tonight is to try to go over the top layer. What this light here was able to do, which we know to be the Mashiach, we have now, in this chaotic state, the Mashiach being this light, he's now actually bringing things into what we call order. Because before you do anything, there must be a program where you can now establish order. And it talked about in the beginning that there was void and there was darkness upon the face of the earth and we talked about the, these key words here that we can't forget is the word um, haya, which means to exist, haya, to exist, and the word was, which is also haya. So we have um, future tense, as we had talked about earlier, and we have uh, present, present tense. 
So in an actuality, what we have here now is that within this here, we have the olive on top. This haya is so important because we can also get from this is that I am that I am. Anybody ever remember reading anything about that before? Mm -hmm. What do you remember reading that at? Uh, back when Moses was uh, talking to uh, exactly to so right so can, uh, exactly. Moses. When Moses acts, um, because we have a situation where this light is there present again, yeah. this light. Yeah. And this light now was, con remember the, the, the burning bush? Mm -hmm. But the burning bush wasn't consumed, but, it, but it, it, it let off an aura or a light. And so when Moses now was given the instructions on how now to deal with the 12 tribes of Israel, because at that point we were in bondage under the Egyptians. Mm -hmm. And so he said, who shall I say sent me? Tell him I am that I am sent you. So I am that I am. So it's kind of hard to define the I am, the I am that I am. So what do you mean who am I? I am the all. I'm the, I'm the existence of, of everything. Every single thing that you see, I am that. I am the trees. I am the grass. I am every single thing. But in order for me now to deal with you, I'm going to have to now manifest myself in something tangible or something that you can understand. And so we now have the physical appearance of a person because of our state of mind, we're not able to see or understand the, the pure magnificence of the Father. All right? We were not able to do that. So again, this Haya, future tense, in present tense, I am that I am is going to be extremely, extremely important. So when we talk about, again, this void and this darkness, we're talking about a state of chaos, and we need it now order in this state of chaos so that we can now have the creation story with Genesis um, 1 all the way down to, I believe, this, like the 23rd uh, verse. All right. We're going to keep rocking and rolling here. Keep it, keep it moving. I'm going to read on down. I'm going to go with verse 6. And Yahuwah Elohim said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and it divided the waters from the waters. Like we had talked about last week, I'm going to do this real fast. So we have water that is above the firmament, and we have water that is underneath the firmament. And we know that to, today to be, well, I'm not going to say the ozone layer, but um, there's a little bit more to it than that. Because there's also, um, as they say, um, a shattered meteorite also now that's um, encompassing the earth. There is a, um, an ozone layer because the Hebrew word for firmament is Hebrew word uh, rikia. We brought that out last week and it just means um, hammered out of something that is flattened to divide the waters um, from that are above the earth from the waters that are beneath the earth. All right, so we're just going to keep it moving there. So again, so Elohim made the firmament and he divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament and it was so. And Elohim called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. So the second day will actually be, I want to make sure that we stay abreast of everything that's going on with this creation here. The second day would be, uh, let's see, let me make sure we get everything right. We have Yom um, Shemi. This is now day two. Yom Shemi. So we are now in verse, where are we at here? Verse nine, right? Mm -hmm. And Elohim said, let the waters under heaven be gathered together unto one place and let the dry land appear and it was so. Now, this is where it's going to get real interesting. 
I believe so anyway. The earth um, was in its chaotic state. There was a flood upon the face of the earth. How long the flood was, I don't know. All right? But we do know um, in this flood state, what we need to also look at now, what is going on on the land because we have the water, okay, sitting on top of the earth. We're going to show now that this is actually now a recreation period, okay? So the best way that we can explain a lot of things here is looking at um, what our um, scientists, our um, archaeologists, and what these guys are doing today. If there was life before and the Father destroyed everything that was on the earth, we have now everything that died beginning, it, it starts to decay. And once something decays, it, uh, it produces ammonia, it produces methane. These gases now, because the water is, is, is above the earth, is actually now acting as um, valuable nutrients for the earth. Anytime anything dies, it breaks down, it goes into the earth, it actually acts at, um, again as nutrients. This is the reason why sometimes you, um, a person that's, that, that has a garden, they, they have, um, what, this, this, uh, they have, compost. They have a, huh? compost. Compost. That's what I'm looking for, yeah. So they have this compost, all right, all this broken down material and everything like that. So they can actually now take this compost, um, weave it into the soil, and it can actually make the soil very, very rich. So we have a situation where the Father now is gathering all of the water into one place, and we now have dry land. That is very, very important. And so um, timing is going to be very, very important, extremely important. All right, so we have that situation that's going on now where the ground is actually now um, preparing itself for this great replenishing process. Um, verse 9 And Elohim to let the waters under the heaven be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And Elohim called the dry land earth and gathered together of the waters called these seas. And Elohim saw that it was good. And Elohim said, Let the earth bring forth grass. That is so, so important. So after this long duration of this flood, and all of these minerals breaking down because of the flood and all the nutrients going into the uh, into the earth, we see the immediate process where the earth now, through the will of the Father, there's no such thing as a coincidence, because of the will of the Father, we see now uh, that the Father, he said, okay, let the earth bring forth the grass, and the earth did exactly as it was commissioned to do, and it began to bring forth grass, herb yielded seed, and the fruit tree yielded fruit at this time, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. So again, that is very important because now we're dealing with GMOs, all right? Mm -hmm. Every single thing that we eat and partake of that grows on from the tree, it must produce a seed. Mm -hmm. Must produce a seed. If it doesn't produce a seed, it's called a mixture. All right, and the Father does not deal with mixing at all. Mm -hmm. He let us know from day one, I don't deal with mixing. Mixing is a contamination. Mixing is um, just like we find um, later on that we're gonna read between uh, the tree of good and evil. Good and evil is a mixture. That's not what we're supposed to be dealing with here, mixtures, mm -hmm. all right? so. With any kind. And we can talk about that a little bit later. Uh, and Elohim, verse 11, Elohim said, Let the earth bring forth grass, and the earth yielded seed, and the fruit tree yielded fruit. At this kind of seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. And the earth bore forth grass, and earth yielded seed at this kind, and the tree yielded fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind. After his kind. And Elohim saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning was the third day. Okay, we should have Yom, what is that, Shulishi? Shulishi, should be 
day three. Right? Uh, verse four. Elohim said, let there be lights in the firmament of Shamayim to divide the day from the night. Okay? And let them be for signs of the seasons and the days of the year. So we know that this is now talking about the sun. Okay? Being the greater light. Oh, we're we, we, we on now. And let them be for lights of the firmament of heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. Verse 16. And Elohim made two great lights. The greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. And he made the stars also. And Elohim set the firmament of the heaven to give light upon, or light, excuse me, upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And Elohim saw that it was good, or told. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. Okay, the fourth day. It's interesting how the light is created on the third day. I mean, on, on the third day, but all the trees and, and grass and seed is created on the second day. So how can that grow without the light? Exactly, exactly. Uh, thing. What, what we should have now, um, too, is that whenever we begin to see um, vegetation begin to grow, we know that just from reading this and from basic common sense, because nothing has changed, we know that that period now, when we begin to see things grow, we know that this is now the beginning of the spring. Mm -hmm. All right, beginning of the spring. Okay, I don't want to go too fast here. All right. Um, okay, now here we go. And Elohim said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that have life and fowls may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And Elohim created great wells and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind, and Elohim saw that it was good. Now, we had talked about this last week, and we want to expound upon this a little bit more. Okay, I'll just say this. My argument here now in verse 20 is that before we have a, an, an Adam, an Adam that's in the garden, that there was a prehistoric man that lived before Adam. Uh, where we, I, I see um, what we're calling a, a Neanderthal, a prehistoric man, and then we have a more um, revolutionized or more, or more intelligent man. Now, in verse 21, we have an Elohim created great wells and every living creature and we went over last week, when you look at that word creature, it's the word um, nefesh. The noon, the, um, the fe, and the sheen, nefesh. It is the Strong's number 5315. And when you look at the Hebrew word study, transliteration, pronunciation, etymology, and grammar, it gives us the definition of soul, self, life, creature, person, appetite, mind, a living being, desire, emotion, passion, that which breathes, the breathing substance of, of uh, substance or being, a soul, the inner being of a man, a living man or being. That's all I wanted to bring out at your earliest convenience. You can do your research and um, uh -oh, and, uh, and look into it. Now, this is what struck me. In verse 21, the Father said, Elohim created great wells, all right? The only difference between a whale, which is a mammal, and a dolphin is that a dolphin is a little smaller than a whale, but they're warm-blooded, they're not reptilians, and they're mammals just like you and I. Mm -hmm. um, they have... Um, I should have brought the pictures, but even when you look at the skeletal makeup of a, um, a dolphin, especially a dolphin, also in a whale too, now was that 
they once had hips, which is very important. And you can also see um, signs where they actually even had feet at one time. This is what I'm getting at. A mammal, these whales show a lot of resemblance to humans, meaning this is that they're warm-blooded. A whale, a dolphin, can actually drown, okay? They have the blowholes that's on the top of their head. Every so often, they would have to come up for air. A whale is not a fish. They're different, <laughs> okay? And what's interesting about this thing here now is that when we begin to look at some of the, um, the, the water creatures, we have to be able to also understand, okay, science. Science doesn't lie. I mean, the, the facts are, are, are there. Meaning now is that if someone was to ask me, is there life on other planets, okay? I'm not talking about um, a whole lot of stuff that you might see in your sci-fi movies. But whenever there's, there's water, okay, nine times out of 10, there's life. Now, when I say life now, I might, I'm not necessarily talking about um, life the way that you and I know it, but I'm talking about microorganisms is what I'm talking about. We're talking about your uh, amoebas, and amoeba is a one single cell, um, it's a single cell, some call them creatures, um, but it's actually um, a cell. And come to find out now is that they did go through stages. It's, it's just a fact, I mean, because it's still happening today. I mean, science is, is beautiful. And what's happening now is that whenever you try to tie in science with scriptures, a lot of people say, listen, you know what? I can't go that route. That's fine. But you're not going to be able to um, get around the fact that some of our earliest forms of life were single cell organisms. Where we now have these single cell organisms, such as an amoeba, they were asexual, meaning now that they didn't necessarily need another partner now to actually procreate. But as these cells now became more complicated, where we now have um, like um, protozoans, we have um, metazoans, these things became more complicated where now they wasn't necessarily asexual, where they actually now needed um, another or something of this kind to actually um, go through what we call this developmental stage. And what the scriptures is telling us now in Genesis, the first chapter, verses uh, 1, 21 to 23, is that life began in the waters. So what are we now to gather from all of that? We have the process where it is a known fact that life began in the waters and the thing that was in the water did transform or migrate from the water to the land. And we can see a lot of that now happening with us humans. One of the things that I found um, real interesting, and I'm going to erase this right here, uh, that was day four. I'm going to erase this here a little bit. Um, what I find interesting, okay, um, because we are all interrelated with everything here that's on the planet Earth in one way or another. But everything has to go according to its kind. When you begin to look at, for example, the Hebrew um, alphabet, all right, um, you have this letter right here, in the ancient Hebrew letter, this is the men. Okay, which means water. And if you look at it, it looks like waves of water. It also means chaos. In the beginning, there was a flood, there was tohu and bohu, there was voyages upon the face of the earth, and so water represents chaos. Then after that, the next letter we have is the, um, this letter here, is the noon. This noon here represents seed and life. All right? 
When we begin to look at uh, the mobility of what happens now with sperm cells, because when you look at the noon in the pictograph, the noon in the pictograph in Hebrew looks like this. A sperm cell. That's what it looks like. In the Aramaic Hebrew, okay, we have this letter here. That is a men. All right, that's the men. What we find interesting here now is that the water also represents the woman. The responsibility of the noon or the sperm cell is to come in contact to the men or the water, which is the woman. And once this happens now is that you have what we have, a men so feet where now the mem closes because now the sperm cell now has actually broken now or is at entered now the womb of the woman. And once it has entered the womb of the woman, it now closes itself off and all of the other sperm cells can't get in normally. They, they, really, they can't come in. But also we see that sperm cell when we begin to look at, um, for example, like, like frogs, okay? Their, their sperm cells look also the same way. And so what I'm trying to share here now is that when you look at now the comparison to, to life, we have a situation like we had talked about last week. As the sperm is traveling inside of the womb um, of, of the woman, it's actually now in, in a water state, and once it reaches its destination, which is the ovum, because women don't have eggs, Reptilians develop eggs, all right? Women have ovums. And once the sperm cell, because the womb is also looked at as the earth, all right? The woman, she's always looked at as the earth. So we have a process where the sperm cell is moving in this, this water, or this, uh, this fluid here, and once it hits the earth, we now have what we call a germination process. Because we're talking about seed. So, boo, when you plant your, your, your grass, all right, it usually takes a grass seed now seven days for germination. Mm -hmm. Which is the same, but I'm not saying it takes seven days for it, but I'm not saying that. But there's a process of, of, of germination that happens here. So, we have now uh, one, two, three, three trimesters. During this trimester, we have now this woman now she's developing, the baby is going through this developmental stage, but in this stage now, inside of the sac or in the womb now, the baby, this is my depiction of the baby, excuse me, all right? He's in all of this fluid and through the woman's umbilical cord, he's getting the oxygen and everything like that. But the point that I'm trying to make here now is that for nine months, the baby is in water. All or oh, embryonic fluid. So everything is centered around water. So it moves from inside of the womb, okay, in a stage of water where it now, when the water breaks, it now goes through its next developmental stage or through the next process where it is now on the earth. So life began in the waters just like your amoebas, your protozoas, and a whole lot of your, um, your, your, your mammals. And then it went through that process to the earth. So life began in the waters, it moved from the waters to the earth, and this is pretty much how the, the, the quick version of how we're here today. <laughs> okay, yeah. I know, I know, I know. I know. Yeah, I'm about, uh, <laughs> okay, um, I'm listening. You're not talking about, uh, you know, uh, Big Bang Theory and all of that stuff, right? I am talking about that there was a Big Bang. Watch this. Watch this. Everything is designed by the Father. There's no such thing as a coincidence. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, the Grand Canyon, all right? That huge crater there, all right? Uh, there's a lot of speculations, but I, I, what I have to do is go with facts, all right? There is so much radioactive meteorite um, 
rocks there. Mm -hmm. I believe, and nobody is supposed to believe it's fine, but I'm gonna have to go with the facts, <laughs> all right? That there's residue of meteorite residue all throughout the Grand Canyon. It's there. So if anybody was to ask me, and I would have to go with the preponderance of the evidence, what caused that, it would have to be a big meteorite. Now, something that large, something that large, all right, it would actually now have the capability now of blocking out the sun, okay, and the moon and the stars, where we now have the earth now in a state of chaos. Now, am I saying that that was the actual thing that caused this, distru um, this disruption here, mm. what we have here? I can't say that. But I can say now is that based upon scienti uh, scientific proof is that um, if a meteorite, let's say the size of a football field, was to fall into um, a major sea, especially something as, uh, let's say, New York City, all right, uh, if, it, if, it, if it fell into the Hudson, um, New York City would no longer exist. New Jersey would no longer exist. The tidal waves coming from that splash would just destroy everything. Absolutely everything. You're talking about um, mass chaos. And then you would have to also look at, too, now, is that everything um, is centered around um, a rotation. Some people said the Earth doesn't rotate. I'm not getting into that tonight, all right? Let's say that the Earth does rotate, all right? And it's going in a particular direction. If something was to come into um, the Earth's atmosphere, which is not going counter the rotation of the Earth, because everything that is coming into the universe now would have what we call a gravitational pull. Mm -hmm. And so this would now cause a major disturbance on the planet Earth. All right, so I'm just trying to get everybody to understand now is that this is all now by masterful design of the Father. We, there can be um, what looks like to us chaos, but out of the chaos now can come um, order. And sometimes you have to have this 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 um, this catastrophe in order to bring order back into its proper place again. So when we talk about the Big Bang, if the Father says, "Let there be light," all right. And understanding the magnificence of the Father and how things are in its proper um, alignment with the sun, like, uh, like we talked about before, the, um, the Earth being the third planet from the sun. If it was the fourth planet, we'd be too cold, it, we, we would die. If it was the first planet, we would be too close, we would all burn up. You know, so we, this is all by design of the Father, all right? Let me just speed it up here because uh, what time you I just only want to rock this by about maybe a little bit, but just give me 30 more minutes, Mr. Cotton, and we'll, we'll be done. How long have you been on, on the air now? An hour and eight minutes. An hour and eight minutes, okay. Okay, let me speed this up here. Okay, um, that way, you know, we have questions, we can deal with the questions. Um, and the evening, excuse me, verse 24, and Elohim said, let the earth bring forth the living creature after its kind. Okay, so this was a, a, a creature of, I believe, of, I, my argument that this was uh, a human, okay, but he was not, um, quote, unquote, in, in, intelligent. It's like a prehistoric man. After his kind, cattle, creepy thing, beasts of the earth after his kind. So because the question then we become now, creature and cattle are two separate things. Okay, because cattle is referring to livestock. This creature is something else. And creeping things and beasts of the earth at this kind of was so. Elohim made the beasts of the earth at this kind, the cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth at this kind. And Elohim saw that it was good. Now, Elohim said, let us make man in our image. What does that mean? All right? Like we had talked about last week is that um, this creature existed. Okay, but what the Father is doing now, what Elohim is doing now, he said, listen, you know what, let's now make this man that already exists, let's make him now in our image and after our likeness. Only thing that this is saying here now is that 
Uh, we need to make this man functionable and he must have a purpose, okay? Because at this state here now, he's in, in his prehistoric state. He needs to have uh, a purpose and he must be created in our image and after our likeness, which is going to be very important. Being that the father chose a man, but he chose or he had other creations, what was so particular or why out of all of the creations that the father created, why did he choose to upgrade a man? What was it that the father needed this man to do in order now, because well, there was a purpose that he needed to, to have. Watch how interesting this gets. Uh, the Elohim created the man in his image, and the image Elohim created he, him, male and female created he, them. Read in verse 27, who do you believe this man is? Adam. Okay, we have this man to be Adam. We have, um, when we begin to look at um, the definition, we have um, mankind. As we know, we have, he created mankind. Just go up here. We're almost done here. Because this is going to have to be another part. And Elohim created man in his own image, and the image of Elohim created he, him, male and female. Who is the male? Adam. Right. But this is interesting now, is that you said that it's Adam, right? Mm -hmm. When you type or when you hit that button with the strong concordance, his name is not Adam. His name is Sakar, which means to remember, not Adam. Re, excuse me, remember. <laughs> Do you have that? Are you able to punch in where it says him? And what word did you get? Um, where? Eight twenty seven. Mm hmm. The hen. Can, can you do a word search with, with um by, by hitting the button and give you the strong recorded number? We got male, we got created, uh, we got he hen. The hen. Him male. We don't have he or him. It's not they don't have a they don't have a recorded number. Right him. Not a So you're not able to pull it up in Hebrew. So, then. okay, so it has the concordance numbers on male, which is 2145, mm -hmm. on the male. And that is saying that that is Zakar. Right. Exactly. That's Zakar. So this, we have, the hem is actually, you have Zakar. And the female's name is, who do you have? Female. Nekaba, not Eve. And the word Nekaba means to pierce, um, it means to pierce, proliferate, to, to puncture, or to go into. And so um, I just wanted to bring that out because a lot of people wasn't aware when you look at this actually um, in the Hebrew is that you have the hem as Zakar. So his name is not Adam, it's Katar. Zakar. Right. Hers is not Eve, it's Nekaba. 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 Yep. Nekaba. Okay, we're almost done, Mr. Carr. So whether we say Adam or Adam, it's all wrong. Uh, at this particular junction here, in Hebrew. Oh, okay. At, at, at this right point, here. right, right here. You're gonna try to prove to me that it's two different people. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> That's what uh, we're talking uh, about here. Because I'm talking about here now is that there was a man, and so we now have Yahuwah Elohim in verse 26, taking this creature, okay, and putting him now in the image and in the likeness, 
Okay, and so with this process now um, was done, we now have this prehistoric man as Zakar, and we have um, the Isha, or the woman, being Nekibah. Verse 28, and Elohim blessed them, plural, and said unto them, so they were given a command to be fruitful and to multiply and replenish. That word replenish is so, so important, um, to replenish the earth and to subdue it. So if if the command is to replenish it, that means that something must have been here before. All right, so I'm telling you, you know, you have to replenish the earth, subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowls of the air and everything that, everything that moved upon the earth. And Elohim said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing sea which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in which is the fruit of the tree yielding seed to you shall it be for me. And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for me, and it was so. And Elohim saw everything that he had made, and behold, very good, and the evening and the morning were the sixth day. And the sixth day and final Mishnachar is um, Yom, who is that? Yom Shani? Shishi. Mm -hmm. With a Shani? Um, Shishi, right? Shiwishi. No, Shishi. Shiwi. 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 Is that right? That's just, um, the sixth bit, right? Yom Shishi. Yom Shiwishi. Because yeah, sleep sleep like that. Yeah, Yom Shuishi. The sixth day. sun falls or goes down on this day, but then we have the ushering in of um, the Shabbat. This should be the seventh day. Do you have um, for the sixth day? Okay. So, uh, Mr. Picard, that's today's lesson. But what I was trying to establish here so far is that at the end of the sixth day, okay, ushers in the Shabbat. And when you go to Genesis, the second chapter, it says that um, everything was done, it was completed, and everything like that. And some people say that Genesis, the second chapter, is just rehashing or explaining or re-explaining right. what happened in Genesis 1. And what I would do um, the next time we come together is to share is that that's not what happened. That is absolutely unequivocally not what happened. All right. So, um, are there any questions on anything that was brought out tonight? We didn't get to balance sheet the second chapter. We kind of recapped. Um, the first chapter. That, um, that was good, though. And, um, was good. and uh, just make sure that you look over Genesis, the second chapter, because we're just going to pick up next week from Genesis, the first chapter, verse 29 to 31, and then we just go ahead and just jump into um, chapter 2. So you're saying that this this uh, Big Bang that happened was actually Yahusha making order out of chaos. Right. What I'm sharing is that um, that light that's in, um, that happened on the first day mm -hmm. was different from what we have in Genesis um, chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. We talked about the sun. Right. The sun. So what's happening with that light there is just um, light shining in a chaotic state. And um, we now have, 
now a, a, a balance or, or order. And that's the reason why last week we went to the book of John and it talked about prior to the Mashiach coming, the earth was in a state of chaos again. Mm -hmm. And the Mashiach being the light of the world, meaning now is that his purpose was to actually uh, bring order back into the world. My argument is that left unattended the way that we are now, we're not progressing. We're actually regressing. Mm -hmm. And so when we begin, it, it, so a, a spark has to happen in order for there to be, um, for order to be set back in its rightful state again. Mm -hmm. um, like, there are those who are not enlightened, okay? And once, we have talked about this before, an, an, an enlightened being has intelligence and there's a spark or an aura a, a, about them. When Moses came from off the mount, all right, being in the presence of the Father, remember they had to put a veil upon his face. Whenever you're in the presence of divinity, you're no longer the same person. You're now like this en enlightened being. Mm -hmm. So there, there's a spark that goes off in you. When Adam and Eve were in the garden, and because of the transgression, they now had to be excommunicated from the garden, they lost that divinity where they're no longer enlightened beings. Mm -hmm. This light or this explosion that I'm talking about, um, and we're going to talk about it more next week, but watch how the, the, the human body is, is just beautiful. Where right now, your body maintains basically a, a, a body temperature of 98.7, 90.6 degrees. Mm -hmm. Now, that light or that burning that's, that's inside of you if not properly maintained, that light can go out where that body temperature that you have begins to, to fall. Okay. Now, what's interesting about this whole thing now is that, and we talk about it a little bit more next week, is that you have to ask yourself, what is actually now maintaining that body temperature? Meaning this now is that it's amazing how we breathe in oxygen, but we let off carbon dioxide, carbon not, not monoxide, dioxide, dioxide yeah, dioxide. Uh -huh. carbon, di carbon, carbon dioxide. dioxide, right, okay, so what happens now is that in order for a match to burn, those are the two ingredients that you need in order for it to ignite, mm -hmm. and so if you were to blow out a match, okay, it's letting off this, 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 this carbon here. And you're doing actually the very same thing. And so what is now happening inside of your body, which is a universe that in that, in that light or that burning that's in you keeps you generated. It, it keeps you motivated and, and, and moving. Mm -hmm. Because in Ezekiel, the 37th chapter now, remember, it talked about a people now that have lo that had lost the light. Mm -hmm. Because um, the father had asked Ezekiel, can, because they become to the point where they're dead bones. You ever talk to a person and you're like, wow, there's no light in that person? Mm -hmm. You know, you just can't seem to get across to that person. So when you look at the creation story, it's the same thing. What I'm trying to share is that there was um, a spark. There was an explosion. And like you said last, last week, we are keep it clean, but just like when the... Um, when the man releases, there's an explosion of sperm cells that's actually leaving him. And what's actually now, what's happening, now, these sperm cells now are actually going into this universe, which is the partner, which is the woman now. And the woman is now being seated. Okay, because the, the average male, a healthy male, now he can put out as many as, as 50 million sperm cells. And so when we begin to look at that process, okay, with this seeding now of this or this explosion, it is the same thing that's happening in the book of Genesis. The earth was seeded. 
Mm. And so when the man goes into the woman now, he's doing the same thing. He's actually seeding her with all of this seed here now, with its goal now to hit the, the earth or the, the ovum, which is now to um, start the process of um, germination or bringing forth children to mm -hmm. be full and to multiply. So everything that you see that's happening um, in the book of Genesis and that you see that's happening in the universe is the same thing that happens between a man and a woman. This explosion, what they call orgasm, I mean, this, this big you know, illumination or illuminating period. Mm -hmm. And so it's the same thing that's happening here. You need to be keeping it clean. It's the same thing that's going on here. The Father said, let there be light, and you know, we're gonna bring some order out of this chaotic state here. Interesting. You know, so, and everything has to be um, in order. Um, as we know, um, that's certain, because a woman isn't ovulating all the time, you know, there's things that she can do to check and make sure that, that she's ovulating. So it's the same thing with the process now of this recreation period, where now we have, after a certain um, time, we see where the father can now begin the stage of um, regenerating or, or redoing the whole thing over again. Plants, um, their first fruits, when we get into the festivals and things like that, these things only grow during certain times of the year. You just can't do things the way that, you know, you want to do it. Everything is following a, a cycle, mm -hmm. long story short. <laughs> okay, so um, if there's no questions, I love the questions, so uh, if that's about it, that's going to be tonight's class. And again, we are talking about what's going on in that garden next week, and that should be about it. And we can move back to the importance of the calendar. All right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, Mr. Cobb, we're going in uh, class for tonight. And uh, I'm going to go to Shofar again um, seven times, and we're going to read um, Aharon's blessing. That's in the book of Numbers, the sixth chapter, verses 22 to 27. And we'll have Zabu to end us out with prayer. And that'll be it for tonight's class.
course. We thank you for our friends and family, those who couldn't make it here, those who are on Facebook and was tuning in, and those who uh, wanted to tune in and couldn't make it. And pray that they will be able to do it next uh, week. So again, thank you for meeting us here. Pray that you will meet us here again next week. We ask that you will bless the meal we're about to receive. Purify and sanctify through the blood of the Lamb. Hallelujah. 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 Ron's blessing. Our own blessing. And this will come out of your for tonight. And Jehovah spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron and to his sons, saying, On this wise you shall bless the children of Yahshua, saying unto them, Yahuwah bless thee and keep thee. Yahuwah make his face shine upon thee and make thee careful unto thee. Yahuwah lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Yahuwah and make sure to my name upon the children of Yahshua and I will bless them. Hallelujah. 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 We are going to see the king. <laughs> exactly.